So my name's um, Ewan Davis, and it's a Scottish name. I'm actually from Scotland, and um, like most Scots, I migrated down to England, lost the accent, and came to London to try and find work via the north of England. So I run our think tank in Cognizant called the Centre for the Future of Work. And I'd like to start with a very, very quick question. Who's optimistic about the future of work? So I, I think that's about half of you. Am I right in saying about half? My generation is so pessimistic, you won't believe it. I think this is really interesting because the way I try and frame this is by, by understanding where my generation has come from. So I was born in the 70s, and I remember a time before technology, before these phones really took off. And I think that's what's changed everything in my life and what's created the stress, because I can remember what it was like being a kid before you could be tracked. And I remember what it was like if you missed the crucial moment of meeting your mates at the Town Cross in Chester on a Friday night, you were done. You were on the bus home, unless one of your friends rang up your mum and left a message. That's all changed. And I think what's really interesting, when you look at the future of work, it really is about the future of us as people and what we do. So I'll give you a, a flavour of what my first job was. I used to spend eight hours a day working for a company called Kurt Geiger. Now, have you heard of Kurt Geiger? Yeah, I'm sure, hello. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Judging by these are beauties. Yeah, so Kurt Geiger is a is very high-end uh, shoe shop. I guess it's a shoe manufacturer owned by Harrods. And they were trying to figure out something rather difficult. They're trying to figure out how they merchandise their shoes around the UK. So my job eight hours a day, was to input onto a spreadsheet shoe size data. So I'd get all the receipts from the shop, and I'd spend eight hours in front of an Excel spreadsheet. It was Lotus 123, but you probably don't know Lotus 123 Excel, and put in shoe size data hour after hour, week after week, month after month. So those merchandisers who were paid a lot of money could figure out how to think about provisioning shoes to Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, London. Leeds and Manchester have very small feet. People from Bristol have very big feet. That's what I learned in my, my time there. <laughs> Who knew? But yeah, there is some, some meaning, meaning behind that. But that job's gone. It was around 25 years ago. Clever software does that job. You don't need people like me to sit there, key in shoe sizes, hour after hour, week after week, month after month. And it gives you an idea of how work is changing. Because make no mistake, your generation, and I'll say your generation, you're way younger than me, your generation has a very exciting path ahead of it. And there's so much pessimism around about the future of work that I'd like you to really step back and think about what the future of work could mean for all of you. So much pessimism. You read the news. You have your news feeds. You read the articles online. It's all about automation. It's all about the robots coming. It's all about swathes of jobs disappearing. Yes, some jobs are disappearing, but there are new jobs just around the corner. And if you think about what's happening to all of us, it will give you a clue of how our economies are going to change. So I have a very simple question, which is this. What will you do, you as a person trying to make your way through life, what will you do when machines seemingly do everything? And this is about the future of work. When you look at the future of work, do you see this as something really optimistic, like half you do? Or do you see this as a bit of a nightmare ahead? How will I afford a house if my career is constantly shifting and shaping? How do I keep my skills relevant for what could be the future of work? 
And some of us look at this with excitement, technical wonder, art of the possible. And I think that's where, where I sit on this debate. I think people will turn around in 10 years' time and laugh at how the NHS is run. In 20 years' time, they'll think, why the heck did we do GCSEs? Did we really? Exactly, you're nodding. My daughter's just done GCSEs. Pile of notes. She'll never look at them again, probably until she's 30. She's gone, why did I do this? Why did I get stressed? There must be different ways of medicating ourselves, educating ourselves, feeding ourselves around some of these new tools and technologies, some of this clever software that's beginning to move into our lives. And I've got a whole other talk about data and how data is beginning to change the world. It really is. But suffice to say, software is now bleeding into every single part of our personal lives and our working lives. If you're a lawyer, if you're a retailer, if you're a banker, if you're in medicine, software is really going to change how you work. But some of you might look at it on this side. You might look at layoffs. If you're my age, you're probably a little bit worried at mid-40s thinking, hmm, these machines, you can actually find some software that writes thought leadership that I do. So if I want to put in some parameters, it will churn out LinkedIn posts about the future of work. What do I do if there's people, machines, sorry, out there that can do this stuff? You might be thinking about restructuring companies. Yes, companies are becoming smaller. They're also starting to change how they want to work with people. And there's some very interesting conversations or articles appearing about the three-day working week, about abandoning nine to five, about abandoning a contract and letting people just work to outcomes. These are very interesting times to think about what the future of work could actually mean. So is it a, a capitalist dream or is it a labor nightmare? Well, actually, I think, yes, we are going to be looking for work, different types of work, but hold tight. We're in the made, middle of a major shift in how we, as people, work together to capture value. And I think this is really important. It's trying to figure out what are the new tools for value, because that's what we do when we work. We work to create value. And if there's new tools available for that, what do they look like? And we do have some precedents here. You can actually go back in time and see that this is actually a good news story. You can sort of see how innovations generate outsized results. So if you know your, uh, your history, you know about the spinning jenny back in the 1750s, 1760s, the mechanization of weaving, the mechanization of textiles led to a boom which changed radically how people worked and where they worked. Think about what the Industrial Revolution meant in terms of how we increasingly worked and how cities grew. You could look at steam and rail, the coming of the railways, and look at the industries that that spawned. W.H. Smith grew up on the back of the railways. And I don't know about you, but W.H. Smith feels like it's kind of dying because shopping is changing around Amazon. You know, it, it, it's slipping away, it's morphing into something else. And W.H. Smith could actually, I don't want to knock W.H. Smith, but you feel like it's an old world, old economy. And you think, this is really not where I want to buy my newspaper, but hey, it's, it's there on the high street. Steam and rail, you know, they led to the fact that we could actually eat fish in our diet because you could transport fish to the center of the cities very quickly. They led to the development of brewing in the north of England. You could transport beer from Burton down to London. If you ever go to, uh, go to St Pancras Station and arrive from Paris, the arches there are designed to hold three hogshead of beer because that was London's beer port for the entire capital. So you can sort of see how these technologies create a step change in how our businesses work. Oil and mass production, we're just coming out of that now. And I would argue 1995 is where we started this shift into digital, and we're right at the start of a major 
compelling change in how organizations create value for the future. And look at the S-curves. Look how they start to narrow and they start to get really steep. And if you're with me, if you see the development of software, the rise of algorithms, all that stuff around artificial intelligence, yeah, it, it's all here, they're all nice words. Basically, this is clever software that's doing work. It should create an outsize kicker on GDP and an outsize way of thinking about how organizations will work in the future. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and um, talk about this guy. I guarantee if anyone can give me who this guy is, you will win, you know, beer for life. Who is this guy? Does anyone know? Maybe this might give you a, a clue. So this guy is Edwin Budding. Edwin Budding in 1837 invented something really rather profound. He went to a, uh, he was a factory worker, he worked in the kind of a, the, 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 the textile industry and he thought there's something going on here that I could use in my life. So he went off and invented the lawnmower. Edwin Budding the lawnmower, have that in your head because there's an impact here from what he did. I call it the budding effect. It's the impact of what that one small in innovation did to our lives. So before Edwin Budding, if you wanted to cut grass, you had to get down with a scythe, you had to get down with shears, it took a team of people a whole day, backbreaking work. Edwin Budding invented a lawnmower and it changed the world. On the back of Edwin Budding inventing the lawnmower, we could have beautifully cut grass. We started to think about games we could play on the grass. We started to play football, tennis. And the budding effect led to something huge. I just want to get your mind around what that could mean. A very simple piece of technology and its impact on the world. I would argue the budding effect led to the creation of a 400 billion pound industry which he couldn't possibly have thought about in 1827. And I think if we can't harness these tools for work, if we can't think about software, if we can't bring man and machine together, shame on us. Because I think it's a dearth of imagination to think that these technologies aren't going to change the world change your world and the ways you live. Think about some of the intractable problems we have in society. Climate change, equality, diversity, balance between the rich West and the poor rest of the world. Fascinating stat from Mrs. Merkel. Europe, 5% of the population, 25% of its GDP, 50% of its global welfare spending. That's not going to work in my lifetime, and it's certainly not going to work in your lifetime. We can't have 5% of the population driving 50% of welfare spending. It ain't going to happen. So some of these new tools, some of these new technologies, some of these new ways of working, some of these innovations in industry are really going to change everything. So I want to leave you with that thought and try to think about the budding effect as you go into your working lives and think about how these tools and technologies could change things. Because I think what's really interesting, if you think about electricity and what it gave us in terms of radio, television, transistors, and then you think about television, the movie industry, you think about Hollywood, you think about all this stuff that can come from a very simple innovation, then you can actually think about what the budding effect could be in your lives, where you work. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and I'm happy to take, uh, take questions at the end. Thank you.